Welcome to Halloween in July in the Advent Calendar House. Thanks for listening, and thank you for being a fiend. This year's Halloween special is an interesting one because it's not a beloved classic that gets played year after year. In fact, as far as I can tell, it only aired once, ever. But by some miracle, it has stuck with me, and I know it's stuck with my guest today. So let's descend to the depths of my cavernous memory back to 1989 and witness the evil magic of golden girl Rue McClanahan as the wickedest witch. My God. (laughs) I am hideous subterranean reptile from the late 80s who doesn't even know martial arts, Mike Westfall. (laughs) And joining me is a man who's been trapped for what could very well be centuries in a cave covered in purple stuff. Please welcome Matt from Dinosaur Dracula. Hey, Matt. Hello, Mike. Uh, Thanks for having me. We were just talking before we started. This is our first time speaking, and we've known each other for like 20 years now. So good to talk to you. You too. Thank you so much. Uh, Yeah, it has been about 20 years You'll always be Mike Fireball to me. Oh, that is the first time anyone has called me that on this podcast. So <laughs> I am honored that it's you. That's that's a deep cut it for is anyone a listening. Deep cut. Uh, you're one of a very tiny handful of people I know who remember this special. And like many things, it's thanks to you that I got to watch it again. Yes, uh, a reader of mine sent me a tape. This is like... Very close to have been having been a lost media situation because you're right. It only aired once, one time ever, never released on video, let alone DVD, not on any streaming platform. It is just this ghost of a TV special. (laughs) Appropriate. But uh, (laughs) yeah, aired once October 30th, 1989 on NBC. Now, did you watch it that night? So I have a confession. If I ever claimed I did, I was lying. I certainly didn't. And that's why it's so fascinating to me because you watch it now. You're like, how did I miss this? It's it's just like it's so us. You know, if you grew up in that era, this was like a totally elf style Halloween special. Oh, yeah. Uh, I do remember watching this. This was appointment television for me. Well, I think it actually came on right after ALF. So it would make sense that you've seen it because I don't know what I was doing that night, but all of us were watching ALF back then. Oh, yeah, we were that that must have been it. I must have seen the previews for it. And I remember making a point to stay up after ALF to continue watching it. But for whatever reason, I didn't tape it. Most people didn't. I would imagine that by the early 2000s, there may have been four or five taped off TV cassettes left in the world. It's a miracle that we have access to this thing. It really is. Yeah, it was just lost to time. And all I had was a memory of it. Didn't remember the name of the thing. Uh, But I had this unusually clear memory of the first few minutes of it with the Burgess Meredith intro. Years ago, in a time of myths and magic, there lived a witch with powers so dark and evil that even the other witches feared her. And I don't know why, but I very clearly remember Rue McClanahan's first line pulling out that bingo ball (laughs) out of the steaming cauldron and boredly announcing I-17. I-17. How could you forget that? Well, well, that makes me feel better. That is just, (laughs) that's the thing I remember. How how did nobody remember this until like the internet era? Like, this is just insane. It's so distinct. It is unlike anything that's aired anywhere ever. Before or since, really. Yeah. Just a weird memory of that existing till you brought it up uh, 
oh, maybe 10, 15 years ago when pictures of it, screenshots of it, or maybe even just scans of old TV guides started to appear online. Right. And that's what a lot of people don't realize is that even like when we were coming up on the early 2000s internet, that was a much different internet. It wasn't like now where we're traveled fast about everything and every anything. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, like even back then, something like this, most people online never heard of it. No, but but when those first few screenshots started kind of appearing out of nowhere, that awoke something in me. And I finally had the name of this old Halloween special I watched that one time. That's when the seeds were born for your future holiday podcast. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> uh, and then a few years back, you got this tape from that very generous reader. Yeah, so I have an upload on YouTube. I think actually there's a second one on YouTube that's a little more complete than mine. It has the original commercials, and I think mine is missing a minute. So I will defer to the other upload for anyone who wants to see this, but definitely worth watching. Yeah, uh, there there's actually a third one that cuts out the beginning, but then that has pieces that the other two that... I, I kind of noticed that too today. I'm like, wait a minute. You kind of have to like Frankenstein all three uploads together. To you really the, do. Yeah. I mean, you could watch any and get the idea, but if you want every last second, you have to watch them all. You do. <laughs> and I did. <laughs> uh, so now we can relive the magic that is the Wickedest Witch. And it really is a magical little special. It's crazy. I mean, this was so, I don't want to say it's a huge budget, but it was not a tiny production. Rue McClanahan was one of TV's biggest stars at that point. Oh, yeah. I Obviously, Golden Girls, like that was like, if it wasn't number one, it was certainly in the top 10. So big star. You had this amazing set full of these little puppets that were, if not designed by Paul Fusco, he was at least involved in making them come alive and i think he had a part in the story too so yeah this was a big deal yeah he co- co-wrote the story he he produced the thing so we got all his buddies who make these puppets and do all the things behind the scenes i mean his wife is still the uh the puppeteer handler or i forget her title but just making sure no one falls through the floor right it's so funny because you know we all know how alf was produced nowadays and when you watch the special, you kind of assume that it was produced the same way. So you're like, wow, this must have been real pain in the ass to put together. Oh, yeah. But but there was an insane amount of love poured into this one off TV special. And it just makes my heart grow three sizes, I guess, watching it every time. It's the thing I love about it is that it's just so like innocent. And it makes you remember yeah. a time when life just seemed a whole lot nicer and simpler. It's kind of like why we still watch the Peanut specials. We love them. They're nostalgic, but they also just make us feel like the world is just a little bit sweeter. Yeah. And, and that love just shows during every second of this thing. Yeah. Starting with the intro that takes us through these twisting caves in what looks like a really old virtual reality game in the back of an arcade. Exactly. Very Sega CD-ish. <laughs> yes. Oh, that's a good that's a good comparison right there. But Rue McClanahan is our titular witch, Avarissa, who was so evil that the other witches banished her to this underground kingdom to rule over the Grievals. Oh, I love the Grievals. <laughs> They're so great. They're, it's this race of little dragon looking puppets. And it's not so much the puppets themselves that remind me of Alf. It's definitely the writing of this. Yeah, I mean, it's to be honest, for me, it is the puppets, too, because if you shaved Alf and made him green, he would look pretty similar <laughs> to these Grievals. Yeah, but Paul Fuss goes doing the voice of at least one, probably more. It is very tongue in cheek. It has that vibe. Yeah, it has the same sort of humor. Yeah, he performs he performs the the number one Grievel assistant. His name's Ersatz. Right. The, I think he's the Grievel that has like the kind of like wizard robe situation going yes, on. Yes, and the grovelly version of Alf's voice. Yep. <laughs> My most vile and hideous queen. Your subjects grow restless for their nightly bingo game. Good. But the Grievals themselves look almost dragon-like, and they reminded me of another puppet from a sitcom. Matt, I know you're familiar with Scorch. Hey, I want to make a music video and win a Grammy. Can you sing? No. Play an instrument? Not. What do you do? I can set the stage on fire! Totally hot, dude. Thanks, dude. Scorch, television's hottest new comedy. 
Oh my God. <laughs> you are completely right. It is so scorch like that you wouldn't be surprised if you found out that one or the other was like use parts from them like it, it's they're very similar well and the puppeteer behind scorch is another voice in this really yes so look at you deep diving in the research well I, this guy okay his name is ron lucas he's a ventriloquist actually uh have you are you familiar with him at all I don't think so. Okay, he had this special on the Disney Channel that I loved. It was called Who's in Charge Here? We taped that, and I watched it constantly. That doesn't surprise me. You were always like the uh, the kind of Disney expert, even going back into the dark ages of the internet. <laughs> it was my favorite piece of media for a few years, this corny ventriloquist special. I wanted to be a puppeteer because of this Scorch guy. <laughs> So you were one of like the 10 people who watched that show. Yes, and, uh, just all the time. So uh, he voices a character we'll meet later. Um, and then they canceled Scorch after three episodes. And I never saw or thought about Ron Lucas again. Uh, but that's why these Grievals look familiar to me. Uh, I'm sure he had a hand in designing those puppets, too, alongside Paul Fusco and his regular crew that he works on. And they designed like, I mean, I'm sure there were some camera tricks going on, but it had to have been at least a dozen distinct different Grievals. Oh, Probably yeah. more. I mean, sure. there are shots where it seems like there's 50 of them, but let's let's be conservative and say that they at least designed 12. Oh, definitely at least 12. Uh, and they must have had a lot of help. Yeah, they do look distinct. You don't get into non-Jim Henson puppetry without making some friends. So they're all kind of here working together. Right, right. And uh, speaking of which, it actually kind of reminds me both in their design and in the especially in the cave design that they live in, kind of like a, almost like a goth fraggle situation. <laughs> yes, I do have that note that this definitely looks like the darker side of Fraggle Rock. Yeah, completely. So it turns out these Grievals have a very deep love of game shows, which is a very Alf thing. And Avarice of the Witch finds herself hosting these game nights for them. Tonight's game is bingo, and one Grievel has won after that I-17 ball she pulled out of her cauldron. And now this Grievel... Oh. And now this Grievel has the audacity to ask what they've won. Oh, God, I didn't want to talk about this. I'm still scarred. I know. It's, it's just the worst. Just to show how wicked this witch is, she tells the Grievel the prize for winning is nothing. And when that's met with booze and complaints, she stands up with her glowing crystal scepter, threatens, don't make me use this. And they all cower in fear. But little nine-year-old me is sitting in front of the TV going, yeah, I want you to use it. <laughs> and she does. Uh so much for what I know. And and what the scepter does is shoots force lightning that turns the Grievals to stone. This on paper might have seemed OK, but in practice, it's pretty disturbing. Yeah, because this is like the sweetest and tiniest of the Grievel bunch was just so happy to have won anything in its entire life. We don't play for prizes. You know the rules. Maybe just a small memento. Something people can see and take me for a winner? I'll do even better. Right, exactly. Like these Grievals, they're a little, uh, you know, weird, but they're not evil by any stretch. So when she turns them to stone, I'm just thinking the only thing I can compare it to is the Judge Doom cartoon <laughs> shoe. <laughs> oh, no, I'm Because every time I watch this special, and I'm, I'm freaking old, I'm like, if I had seen this as a little kid, I think I'd be pretty scarred by that. But based on what you say, you were kind of rooting for that. To happen. <laughs> yeah, well, my own fault, I guess. <laughs> uh, and then she follows it up with the best pun afterward. There. Now people can take you for granted. Wow. That's the line I always remember. Yep. <laughs> I-17 and now people can take you for granted. Classic. So this story is about Avarice's search for a way to escape her cave kingdom and return to the surface, even though it's a really nice looking cave kingdom. That's what I'm saying. It's like, I mean, the Grievals are a little annoying, I guess, but she's got it made down there. She's got her magic powers. She is completely in charge of all of them. 
why mess with success? Yeah, I, I don't know. Maybe it's just 300 years is a long time. We learned that it's coming up on 300 years since her sentence began. Uh, True. And most of us couldn't handle being quarantined for a year without starting to feel a little crazy. So I get that. Extremely true. Fair point, Mike. Fair point. Yeah. And multiply that by 300 and add dozens of little gremlin servants that somehow make you host a live game night. Yeah. And like stick whoopee, whoopee cushions on your chair yes. when you're not looking and things like that. So, yeah, she was a little fed up. One one whoopee cushion too many. Yeah. Uh, so she's been hanging out down there hosting bingo games for three centuries. Still doesn't sound like a bad gig to me, but I understand. Yeah, so it was time. She wanted to mix it up. Yeah. Uh, so to find out what conditions have to be right in order to lift this curse, Avarissa goes to consult the wise and all-knowing shtick. The shtick scene. Oh, boy. Okay. So, like, I guess it's cute. It's so out of nowhere when you watch the special. Like, okay, we're doing this. Nice. It really is. It was just, let's see what other famous person we can get in this special somehow. <laughs> yep. And that someone is Jackie Gale, who was a comedian who'd always be on those Dean Martin Friars Club roasts. That's how I know him. And he is he is doing his shtick. He is. Yeah. I am the all knowing shtick. I know all and have seen everything. Nothing exists without my knowledge. For I am the all knowing keeper of all that is noble and worth keeping. Who are you? Uh, so to contact Shtick, you need to video conference with him on an evil soda machine because that's the dream. Yeah. She has to get a quarter from her grievel in charge and she goes to the soda vending machine to contact Shtick. He already knows Aphorissa has found the loophole in her curse clause and tells her to break the curse. She must get a child to commit a cruel, evil, despicable deed. Oh, boy. Yep. So there's very specific rules. Doesn't seem so hard, but, you know, we'll see how it goes. And in order to get a child, she'll have to send a grievel to the surface to bring one back. Oh, and of course, it has to happen before midnight tonight or she'll have to wait another 300 years. Yes. And I believe it's set on Halloween night appropriately enough. Yes. It, it, Halloween night is part of the where there was a rhyme up here. And 300 years hence. On Halloween night, the curse may be lifted if conditions are right. That's right. Well, God, very clever. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad her sentence is poetic. <laughs> so to determine to grieve the send to the surface world, she sets up another game show to find which one is the least stupid, as Burgess Meredith tells us. But anyone who guesses wrong gets the zappy turn into the statue treatment. Where can you find the English Channel? Yes, hideous creature number two. On cable? Wrong. Not only wrong, stupid. You must be eliminated. Which is, again, you know, maybe a little less impactful as the first time it happens. But still, every time I see it happen, I'm like, God damn, that poor Grievel. Yeah, you squirm a little every yeah. time it happens. Though they did do a really nice job on whatever they made those little statuettes out of. They're really well made. Yeah. Uh, and I'm thinking if she hates these Grievels so much, why didn't she just turn them all to stone? Yeah, yeah, she could have very easily. Have a neat little statue garden in her neat little cave castle and yeah. uh, really class the place up. But since she's turning Grievels to stone when they answer questions wrong, the winner by default is the one who didn't buzz in. And that's the character Ron Lucas is playing. His name is Sammy. But it's scary up there. Something might happen to me. Sammy is the best. Sammy is, I think, my favorite character in the special, which is a big statement considering that Blanche is in the special. So <laughs> right. Sammy rules. Yes. Uh, and, and he's terrified to go to the surface world. So Avarissa gives him something to protect him, a rock, which she enchants with the power to give Sammy one wish in an emergency. Yeah. So it's. Instead of like Chekhov's gun, we have Avarice's rock situation because, right. yeah, obviously this is going to come into play at some point. Sure. Otherwise, you're thinking, wait, you can do that? Yeah. You create a wishing rock. Why didn't she just give one to a Grievel and threaten to turn them to stone if they didn't wish to break the curse or something? It is sort of a plot oversight. Yeah. The old blackmail genie trick. 
But instead, we're going by the book, and Avarissa opens a portal to the surface and sends Sammy up in a wave of 1989 CGI glitter. Oh, God, I love the glitter. It's they, so they, And they good. use it for pretty much everything in this special. You're going to get a lot of glitter if you watch this thing. Absolutely. Uh, but it fits. And Sammy's up to find a child that she can trick into doing something evil. So now Burgess Meredith tells us we're in a house somewhere near Boston. Very specific and very weird. Very, very specific. It had to be a, a reference to some writer of the show. Sure. Uh, and very weird because earlier he told us Avarice's kingdom was somewhere underneath Ohio. Hmm. Odd. I'm not going to sit here and pretend I know how glitter portals work. Fine. <laughs> we're near Boston inside the home of Lewis a young aspiring magician whose bedroom shelves are full of playing cards and books like The Secrets of Houdini. Rise, Jack of Diamonds. Rise. This trick never works. Why is it that in every 80s special, there is this assumption that kids our age were all about magic? I don't know. I remember having one magic book that showed me a few card tricks, but I wasn't like super into it. Yeah, and like this kid is like his entire room, his entire identity is he wants to be a magician. Yeah, that's that's his calling. My yeah, my book of magic was I feel like one of those things I sent away for and free stuff for kids. God, uh, Mike, don't bring up free stuff for kids unless you want to have a twenty five <laughs> minutes uh, aside here. Oh dear, I <laughs> love that book. Oh, it was so great, and then I just of course gave up after maybe half an hour. I'm just like none of these work. Of course, it was the it was the process in getting the stuff from that book. It wasn't actually using it. Oh, yeah. No, we didn't care about what we got. It was yeah. just learning about how mail works. Exactly. So Lewis is played by Raffi de Blasio, who around this time was on another show called Almost Grown. I didn't know that. Yeah, I had never watched that, but I recognize this kid as Albert Brooks's younger self in the movie Defending Your Life. He has been in a lot of stuff. I think he's actually still a working actor. It looks like it. He has a modern headshot of him as a full grown adult with a beard and everything. Right. I think I saw that he was on Curb Your Enthusiasm. I mean, these oh, all right. are bit parts, but he's been on shows. So still going. Good for him. Yes. Still working. I would I would think you would agree, though, that in 1989, in this particular case, it was what you did if you didn't have access to Fred Savage, because it was essentially like it <laughs> yeah. almost feels like it was written for him. Oh, it could have been a Fred Savage. They, they could have gotten Ben Savage for this. and It would have worked. Yeah. And it kind of adds up, because if you look at Lewis in the special, his shirt is so ill fitting that it couldn't <laughs> have been his. Yeah. He has like no hairdo. It's just like all over the place. Like, Jesus, they put so much work into this. And this kid looks like he just fell out of bed into this special. <laughs> right. Well, he is still in his room. True. Uh, and with a flash of light, Sammy the Grievel appears in his bedroom and begs him not to turn in the stone because that's all he knows from humans. Of course. Uh, and instead, Lewis and Sammy spend the rest of the night getting to know each other and becoming friends like any reasonable young boy would do if they met a tiny dragon looking gremlin in their bedroom. No questions asked. We go immediately from the introduction to this very 80s montage of them becoming fast friends. Yeah. Uh, and I my only question is, it's supposed to be Halloween night, right? Oh, my God, you're right. This kid is. In his bedroom, playing with magic tricks on Halloween night. How did that happen? Get out. Why aren't you trick-or-treating, kid? Yeah, jeez. I don't know what time it is, but it sounded like they had quite some time, and they play a lot of games later. I don't know. I, it couldn't have been later than five. He should have been doing Halloween stuff. You're absolutely right. Sure. Did this portal Avarissa open target the loneliest kid within a thousand-mile radius and send Sammy there, maybe? Well, it does kind of come off that way, to be real. That does tie up the Boston, Ohio thing. True, true. But Burgess Meredith doesn't mention anything like that. Instead, we see Lewis show off some simple magic tricks he knows. And Sammy is, or at least acts, very impressed and asks Lewis how he'd like to see some real magic. But Lewis sadly replies, there's no such thing. There's no magic. Kids, you're talking to a little winged magical creature who appeared in your room and speaks perfect English. 
Yeah, he just witnessed like some pretty hardcore magic, actually. You're right. If I met a Grievel and he told me magic was real, my instant would reaction would be awesome. Let's go. Yeah, exactly. So Sammy has Lewis join him over in the corner of his room for the disappearing Sammy and Lewis trick. And the light whisks them away like before. And we cut to commercial. More glitter. More glitter. Mm hmm. And it looks like this special was sponsored by McDonald's and it was Halloween. So they were promoting their ice cream gift certificate books. The those are the Roger Rabbit ones, if I'm not mistaken. They are. Yes. Oh, yeah. Very classic. I still have the books. I actually have the translate from that. Oh, wow. Nice. Yes. A big time favor. And you're right. McDonald's sponsored this and every other 80s TV special. Oh, sure. I wish I had gotten more of those books as a kid, but then I would always forget to go get the ice cream. Yeah, it would be the same situation here. It would, it, it, in theory, it's like the greatest thing in the world. I guess in practice, you are more likely to lose that slip of paper before using it. Sure. And then you would just forget McDonald's even sold ice cream. Exactly. I actually have never gotten ice cream from McDonald's. So Really? That's never happened. I mean, it's it's soft serve. It's nothing special. I'm going to be honest. I was I would even know if I was going to get ice cream, I'd rather just get more fries. I'm a salt guy, Mike. Yeah, I feel you there. <laughs> I don't think of McDonald's when I think of sweet things. McDonald's has a monster of an idea. Happy Halloween certificates. A book of 10 is only a dollar. Your gang can turn them in for free dessert treats like cones and sample size sundaes at McDonald's. Each book also comes with a mail-in certificate for this free Roger Rabbit when you buy your video cassette of the smash hit who framed Roger Rabbit. McDonald's Happy Halloween Certificates. A deal so good, it's eerie. Well, back from the break, Avarissa has disguised herself as a much friendlier, grandmotherly figure. It looks like Blanche cosplaying is Rose. Yes, it does. Because <laughs> I had a note here that it's essentially Blanche, but the clothes don't quite fit. Right. But you're right. It is. And I mean, I think Rose has actually worn an outfit many times in the show that is extremely similar to that. She might have. Like, she's definitely worn an apron a lot like that. Right. It's like that that kind of dress that has almost like a doily tablecloth around the collar. <laughs> yes. Uh, now I want an episode of the Golden Girls where they all switch personalities for an episode. Oh, great. Uh, this is the closest we get. And Avarissa warns the Grievals they'd better extend every courtesy to their coming visitor or else she'll turn them all to stone. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they semi agreed, but I don't know if it was within them. Yeah, I don't know, because then she sits down on a whoopee cushion and every Grievel is quick to actually take responsibility. So I'm not sure how scared they really are. I think that was a strategy, you know, because if they all take credit for it, then she has to decide, am I just going to let this go or am I going to kill everybody? So that's a lot a of solid work. strategy. It's a lot yeah, of work. Yeah. Uh, but before she can do anything about that, the whole cave begins to shake as the portal reopens for the arrival of Sammy and Lewis, who is very impressed that he's just been teleported. He's impressed, but I have to say, kind of took it on the chin. He's, I would be freaking out if this was me. Right. He's just... Well, I'm here now. Yeah, big deal. Quite a bit wary of Avarissa, though, because she is clearly not used to speaking nicely to people. No, she's uh, she's she's trying to act like, you know, very nice woman, but she's Avarissa. So all of her badness kind of leaks through. Yeah, she she's like me if I ever throw a party and I'm not used to throwing parties. I'd be like, welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm terrible at small talk. Please stop me. Yeah, yeah, I know exactly what you're saying. Same. Yeah. Uh, so she invites Lewis to play some boardwalk style carnival games, all involving abusing a Grievel in some way. Not quite as bad as turning them into stone, but still a little hard to watch. Yeah. But uh, Matt, do you have a favorite among these games? The tester strength. Yes. Uh, the one where, you know, you hit the the target with a hammer and you make the thing go flying in the sky. Absolutely. Is favorite. In this case, of course, she has tied a Grievel to the whatever. So when you hit it with a hammer, you kill the poor Grievel. Yeah, uh, this one at least it doesn't seem as bad for me or for the Grievel. Like that seems to be the one that does the least damage to a Grievel as well. True. You have that milk bottle game where it's Grievel stacked on top of each other. 
and you got to hit him with a big ball. That's right. A lot of abuse to the Grievals. Yeah. Uh, and Lewis appears to be so against the idea of harming another living thing that he wants no part in any of these games. He's just the sweetest, kindest boy. He really is. He will not take the bait. No. And what acting. I love how, like, every time Avarissa is trying to get him to do something bad, he has this, like, grand gesture of waving his hands and, like, shaking his head back. No way. Oh, yeah. It's a big, it's it's like a big say no to drugs PSA commercial. No, thank you. Exactly. Like, he was playing to the cheap seats in the vac. Like, he wanted everyone to know that he was not going to do the bad thing. Absolutely not. And for the most evil witch in existence, Avarissa seems to be okay just moving on to the next idea instead of scaring the kid into doing what she says. Yeah, I mean, if you think about this, like, objectively, it wouldn't have been that hard to trick this kid into doing, like, what she's doing is a pretty extreme way to get to the goal. Yeah. I don't know if she's thought this through well enough, but she's committed to the bit at least. True. Even tries to get him to sell her a used car, clearly the most heinous of sins. And again, Lewis is just like, in, you see him in the back of that shot, just like, no, 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 no. So animated. I want no part of this. Uh, that's another very Alf joke. Oh, yeah. I mean, the, the Alf humor is all over this special. Oh, it's almost yeah. like it's Alf without any kind of filter whatsoever. Yeah. If all of the Alf impulses were just constant. Just throw them all together. Yeah. Used car salesman sounds like that's what the president of Melmac would do for a living. Yup. Uh, but Lewis, we're told, was pure of heart. Well, we can see it on the screen. He couldn't commit an act of evil, including automobile sales. So instead, we see him performing card tricks for the Greebles, while Avarissa just sits on her throne and watches, disgusted and out of ideas. Comparing him to Pollyanna, if I remember correctly. <laughs> yes, that's right. All the kids in the world, I get Pollyanna. This is another good line, and actually one of the better lines in the special. <laughs> But she takes note of Lewis's love for magic, so she plans a quiz show to tempt Lewis with true magic by answering super easy questions like, what's the second letter of the alphabet? Oh, Drat, I almost had it. Lewis? B. Absolutely correct. And Lewis wins prizes like the ability to create music by waving your hands. And we get him doing some air guitar, and he was really into doing that. Yes, because he's a 10-year-old boy in 1989. He opts for the air guitar that sounds like a Casio keyboard set to guitar. <laughs> Freaking lootly. It's, it's just, it's madness. Wow! I've just been granted the ability to create music out of thin air. Here's the Seinfeld theme. <laughs> Uh, Lewis also wins the power of levitation, and this is especially enticing for him because earlier we saw him struggling to get a playing card to rise out of the deck. Now he can do it by just pointing at it, only this card keeps rising up and flies to the ceiling. More glitter, by the way. More glitter, yes. Well, actually, the most glitter in the entire special is on that card. It's on it's this just, card. Yeah, It's just a sea of glitter. But now I'm wondering, is that how he thought that trick worked? Apparently. You know, he was a hard to read kid. Lewis, I just don't quite get him, but he might have. I felt for him the most in that because I know I was a dumb kid and I totally believed magicians were making cards float. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he, he seemed to buy it. I was a very gullible kid. I thought every pro wrestler with the second job actually worked that second job. So, oh, of course. <laughs> Like actual Repo Man trying to make ends meet by fighting people. Repo Man. And because of Repo Man, you thought all Repo Men actually dress that way. Yes. Like trench coats and Zorro masks with tire tracks on their back. <laughs> yes, they all got run over. And a... <laughs> well, time's starting to run out for Avarissa. It's getting dangerously close to midnight. So for the last round of her fake game show, she offers Lewis the power of her scepter. Mm. And all he has to do is pointed at Sammy and think stone. That's it? Yeah. It's a cake. Yeah, marble cake. What's supposed to happen? Nothing, he just turns to stone. Here, go, go, go. Bad move. Yeah, now he's hesitant. Yeah. For the wickedest witch, Avarissa is very honest and perhaps a little too patient. Why did she spill it? She right. was so close. Nothing, it's just magic, but I don't know. 
The kid wouldn't even throw a ball at a Grievel. Of course he wasn't going to turn one into stone. No, of course. His first question is, well, he can be turned back, right? Yeah, sure. She says, all right, well, now she's starting to think on her feet a little bit. But yeah. But Sammy bravely tells him, no, I'll stay stone. No, no, I can't. I'll stay stone. And in, in that cute little Grievel voice, you yeah. just feel for the little guy. You do. And Avarissa tries to tempt him by telling him to think of ultimate power. And she's starting to sound like one of those little comic strips people hand out about how Dungeons and Dragons teaches devil worship. Yeah, it's a lot like that. It is. Uh, And Lewis takes this grimacing face as he points the scepter at Sammy. But instead, he ends up dropping the scepter, causing the crystal on top to smash into little bits of glitter. And that transforms Avarissa back into her witch form. The plot was foiled. It was. Uh, the one part I have to just point out, when when Lewis is like debating whether or not to turn Sammy to stone, they do this thing where they have close-ups of all of the primary characters' faces. <laughs> yes. It feels like it goes on for 16 minutes. Oh, that's the longest part of this whole thing. It's yeah, like it's, the end of it, Toy Story 3. Exactly. I'm like, I was getting flashbacks to like, the the barge scene from Return of the Jedi. Like you could totally (laughs) put that theme over that scene. You could. No one would know the difference. Uh, I still think this special is fantastic, but my one complaint, not enough time with Rue McClanahan in witch makeup. True. I mean, that might have been like in her rider or whatever, because, you know, she her whole gimmick was that she was beautiful. She doesn't spend that much time being ugly. And they really hagged her up like. Yeah, she was not uh, made to look attractive. This was not a vixen witch. This was an ugly witch. Yes, that that's a good point. She has a very unique look, and she's got to stick to that. But, yep. but both looks suited her very well for this. True. But also, it's now past midnight, so Avarissa tells Lewis, You little brat, you've renewed my lease for another 300 years. Sorry. Sorry. You saw me. Oh. Stupid freaking kid. <laughs> and for his part, this kid is very apologetic. I would this, this is such a nice boy. I'm sorry, Because <laughs> <Right? laughs> he has no idea what's happening right now. And yet still pretty calm. Yeah, he just thought he won the strangest game show he's ever seen in an underground Fraggle Cave. <laughs> yeah. And now the host is suddenly changed from a grandmotherly homemaker dress into this witch. But it really looks more like she's just wearing a medieval queen's dress. Yeah, it's almost like if you take the classic Scarlet Witch costume and just make it look like it's a thousand billion years old. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's a good. (laughs) It does look like that. Uh, And she's sitting here berating him like he had any idea what he was supposed to do. Or like he had any idea that dropping a scepter was going to cause this insane just chain reaction. Uh, but now he starts to get really upset because Avarissa tells him Lewis is stuck down there now, too. Oh, no. Because as far as she knows, there's no other way out of there. What are they going to do, Mike? I don't know. He's obviously distraught now that he'll never get to see his family again. And now all the Grievals start to feel really bad for him, especially Sammy, who's the one who brought him down here in the first place. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of Sammy's fault. It is. For a while, he seemed rather malicious to me at first when he showed up in his room and was like, I'm a kid. As in child? Yeah. Bingo. See, I almost feel like this was an hour long special that was somehow just cut down to 30 because it feels like we're missing a whole bunch of scenes where those two become real friends. It's very abrupt because you're right. It goes from Sammy being like kind of a jerk to their like, total friends and then he's a jerk again this is one of those specials that doesn't drag it goes pretty rapid fire and it would actually benefit from being longer you're right yep uh but now sammy feels bad and says he wishes he could get lewis home and hey remember that wishing rock well sammy didn't but sure enough (laughs) there's that wish and lewis suddenly disappears and he was never seen again when you say disappears, you're not lying. He's gone. The essential star, the hero of the special, they don't show him even land back in his bedroom. Like, what happened here? 
there is something missing from this show because to not show him back home was a decision. It really was. We don't get a goodbye scene. He just poofs away in that CGI glitter. He's back home and we never see him again. Yeah, we can only hope he made it. In fact, the Grievals don't even know for sure that he did. No, and, and, and unfortunately, this is where we start to wrap things up really quickly. Very quickly. We're told Avarissa is left powerless and trapped for another 300 years, and now she doesn't even have a scepter that can turn Grievals to stone. Shows she's doomed to centuries of whoopee cushion jokes and no one respecting her. <laughs> It's pretty awful. It does seem like, you know, if you're controlling the Grievals, that's one thing. But to be at their mercy, that does seem like a pretty bad sentence. Yeah. Now now I'm starting to understand, OK, this might not be so great. Yeah. But then Burgess Meredith takes us out by telling us. So don't be surprised if some Halloween night, a strange glow fills your room and a Grievil comes to take you away. Yeah, this was definitely somebody who had seen Gremlins like two days prior to writing it. It's <laughs> exactly the same. It's Ran Pelcher to Meredith. It really is. That part's scarier than this whole special. It is, because, I mean, I mentioned the Gremlins ending. That totally stuck with me, and this would have, too. The idea that a monster could just appear from nowhere when you're walking around your house. And just take you away from there. But then they they ended kind of sweetly with Burgess Meredith mumbling off with it. Well, it probably won't happen again. <laughs> well, be surprised. I mean, it's not very likely, but it could happen. OK, the odds against it are, 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 are tremendous. But then again, all right, all right. It definitely won't happen. Happy? It's practically impossible. No way. Very silly ending, but it fits for this. It's it does. I mean, yeah, he hedged his bets there at the end, but it's um, yeah. it's a sweet show for sure. Yeah, uh, but but that ends the tale of the wickedest witch. Matt, any final thoughts? Oh boy, so God, I think the most fascinating thing to me is still the fact that you have this anomaly. It is a big deal. You have Rue McClanahan, huge TV star. You have this huge production that is essentially fronted by Alf himself. Yeah. How? How does it only air once? How is it never referenced again? It's like you have to come up with a theory to explain that. Like, I've always wondered, did they frick up the rights issues and for some reason they can't air it again? Did the president of NBC hate it? Something had to happen here. Yeah, I wonder if it is on the network level now that you mentioned that, because I know... Paul Fusco's earlier stuff before Alf, that's all out on DVD. You could stream some of those if you have the right Amazon Prime account, I think. That's what I'm saying. Like, especially in these days when people are pulling, companies are pulling out whatever they have in their vaults, nothing for this. Absolutely nothing. No, but I'm I'm very glad that you have an upload up and those other three uploads are out there. Definitely take the time to watch this. It it is a treasure of a special. It is. I've heard from many people over the years who did not grow up with it that just found the YouTube upload and now they put it on every year. Sure. And and a lot of care was put in to the look of this special and maybe not enough of the story, but it looks phenomenal for a 1989 TV special starring puppets. Yeah, it's, it's I mean, it's obviously they're using backdrops, but it comes off like they have this enormous cave set. Yeah. And it and even end like the credits go over this beautiful castle shot in this underground cave. And oh, it's so nice. It really is. Just I want that as some sort of shadow box thing. <laughs> but that could be your screensaver if you still yeah. use screensavers. But I am very glad someone out there thought to tape it because I don't know why I didn't. Same. I get mad at myself all the time because, you know, we watch these specials every year. Why didn't we tape it so we could watch it during the off season? I wish I knew, mm -hmm. but taped every other Halloween thing from around that time. But no matter. Matt, thank you so, so much for talking with me. This was a blast. Yeah, it was. Thanks so much, Mike. Uh, I always enjoy talking about the wickedest witch, the most obscure yet totally deserving of being on that upper shelf with all of the other classic Halloween specials. Absolutely. Uh, and if people want to trick you into visiting their underground cave kingdom by enticing you with the prospect of real magic, where can they find you on the Internet? You can find me at DinosaurDracula.com or on the Purple Stuff podcast available wherever podcasts are available. 
Yes. And those links will be in the show notes. Matt, thank you again. This this was awesome. No problem. Thanks, Mike. It was really great to talk to you. Yeah. So this has been another Halloween in July podcast, pals. And you can find the show notes for this episode at adventcalendar.house. And you can say hi to me on Twitter at Fall West Mike and Advent Cal House. It's back to Christmas in July in a couple of days, but I can promise more grotesque monsters from another world. Until then, for Matt from Dinosaur Dracula, from my haunted underground torture carnival of boardwalk games, this is Mike Westball saying, beware of the icy batch and hurry back. Coming up next, Jacqueline Smith is out to settle the score. A powerful NBC world premiere movie. And Wednesday night, if you want to learn the subtleties of seduction, then go to the master himself, Dan Fielding, on an all-new night court. Followed by My Two Dads on a special night. Then Sam must depend on blind faith when he leaps into the life of a concert pianist on Quantum Leap Wednesday. And now, these messages. I know you. You're tired of the same old joy of human compassion, overflowing generosity, and quaint, totally anxiety-free coziness of the holidays. You need Christmas to get a little bit weird. I'm Craig Kringle, and I've got you covered. On the Weird Christmas Podcast, I talk to a never-ending garland of writers, historians, filmmakers, and rampant weirdos who do their best to make sure we don't forget just how beautifully odd this holiday can be. We cover everything from Krampus to Christmas werewolves, the real winter elves like the Scandinavian Tomten and Nissa, to Iceland's 13 Yule Lads. And every year we share a good old traditional Christmas ghost story to keep things festive. I also host an annual flash fiction contest so we don't have to read Dickens again. So if you're a real traditionalist who wants Christmas to get back to its roots of creepy monsters, acknowledging the frozen, lifeless heart of winter and eating animal heads, come over to the Weird Christmas Podcast. Or check out weirdchristmas.com and all the surreal vintage postcards I share on social media. So Merry Christmas, and here's hoping Krampus doesn't whip you off to wherever he's from. Next time on the Advent Calendar House...